Okay, we'll start. Today we are in, uh, in the first chalak, um, the first uh, portion of, of Mor Nebuchim, chapter 34. In the Pines version, we're on page 75 is where we left off. <laughs> um, uh, if you look near the bottom, there's some uh, quotes in italics. And then the, it's about six lines from the bottom where it starts, there is also a necessity of another kind. Right, which um, which is where I'm going to start from, but before I start doing that, I just want to remind everyone of what Ramam is talking about right now. So, in this chapter, he's discussing why it is uh, he's he's listing the reasons why you can't just jump to all of these ideas about spirituality and God, all of the ideas that Ramam is conveying to us in in this book. You can't just jump to it instantaneously. There has to be a process of getting to know that knowledge. And he gave several reasons. Um, and the reason which he's in the middle of discussing right now is the third. The third reason, as we'll see in a minute, is kind of divided up into special, into several parts. The, the one we spent a lot of time in the last lecture discussing was the fact that Raman pointed out that in order to... Um, to get to this knowledge, to truly understand this knowledge, there's a long process of getting there. It's not so easy. You have to work your way up to it. You have to learn all these preliminary ideas. You have to, and Ramam emphasized, you need to know science. You need to know how the world works. You need to observe the world around you. You need to learn logic. You need to learn math. We discussed this before, what, what Ramam laid out. And then, only then can one understand these concepts or these ideas. Um, now, um, the, the, uh, um, so Ramam is continuing on this path, and he's still discussing this long process of getting to know these things. Uh, and I, I think about while we discuss this, what does this mean? Which ideas do people need to get to know? And one of those, the, the, the ideas that Ramam is talking about are the ideas that the Guide of the Perplex is based on, which are the concepts the, of what God truly is. What does it mean that there's God? And, you know, what does it mean, you know, that God, we say God isn't, isn't an old man with a long beard on a throne, like, what is he, what isn't he, all, all these lofty ideas, etc., are ideas which you need to go through the process of logic in order to understand them. Now, um, the, now I'm going to start now from there is also a necessity of another kind for achieving knowledge of the preliminary studies. Not only do you have to go through the work, but there's something else you need to know about this process of learning, which is required in order to get a real understanding. And that is, it arises from the fact that when a man seeks to obtain knowledge quickly, and this is so, so relevant, what Ramam is about to say is so relevant to modern times, it, it, it's like almost like he's talking to any one of us who has ever used social media of any sort or even watched any media, modern media of any sort. We all want to learn about a subject and we want to know, everyone wants to know the, you know, the, this subject, this topic, but no one is willing to go through the process of really learning and understanding where it's derived from, how you get to that point. Everyone just wants to know the knowledge at the end of the line without going to the process of getting there. And when one does that, what happens is, um, <clears throat> Ramam says, it arises from the fact that when a man seeks to obtain knowledge quickly, if you try to skip the preliminaries and you try to skip to the end goal and just say, just tell me the bottom line, many doubts occur to him. So then when the bottom line is something which you don't like or you don't feel is right or you don't understand, you doubt those things. You think they're wrong because you didn't understand the process by which you got there. Think about a scientific process of learning a certain idea, an idea that, that's mind-blowing, an idea, I don't know, the theory of relativity or something like that, or E equals MC squared, that somehow mass and energy are interchangeable or something. So these are ideas which intuitively you don't necessarily understand them. The only way to understand the ideas is by going through the entire process of getting there. Then the idea makes sense. If somebody tries to tell you this idea, and you'd have no, you've never went through the process, then you say, ah, that's ridiculous. It makes no sense, right? More quickly understands objections. I mean to say the destruction, I'll give an example of, 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 about the theory of evolution <clears throat> that I've been using these past few months. A certain uh, politician recently stood up in public and said, 
the following objection. It can't be that there's evolution. Evolution must be a bunch of baloney because if we evolved from apes, then why are there still apes? Okay. I'm not going to bother explaining that because that's we're not discussing evolution in this thing. However, the only way someone can make such a stupid comment is if they'd never under nobody ever sat down or they never bothered to sit down and learn what evolution means and learn what the science is behind it and learns learns the concepts and ideas that get you there, right? So if you skip the process, then all of a sudden the final conclusion sounds silly, it sounds dumb, or it sounds wrong, and you think it's wrong. Right. But the problem is that what's wrong is not the concept of the idea. What's wrong is the fact that you were too lazy to go through the process of getting to the truth. So um, I mean to say the destruction of a particular doctrine, this being similar to the demolition of a building. Right. A guy looks at a building, you know, he just knocks the whole building down because because he doesn't he forgot about the foundations. Right. Now, the establishment of doctrines as true and the solution of doubts can only be grounded upon many premises taken from these preliminary studies. In order to get to that building, you need to go through all of the preliminaries. You need to go through all of the building blocks. You need to get there, right? One engaged in speculation without preliminary study, if you're going to just speculate and come up with ideas without actually studying and proving and getting there, right, is therefore comparable to someone who walked on his own two feet. In order to reach a certain place, the guy's going on a trip and then he falls into a deep well and he didn't bring along anything to get out of the well, right? He didn't bring along any of the tools he needs to get out. So he's just stuck. That guy would have been better off if he never went on the trip in the first place. And I, I, I know my son is, 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 is on this, this thing and the two of us recently went to hiking on the Appalachian Trail for a couple of days. And, um, and had we not been prepared with the things that we needed on the trail, we would have been stuck. We would have had nothing. We wouldn't have had, you know, the tent. We wouldn't have had food. We wouldn't have had, you know, whatever we needed, right? And the things that we didn't plan for. So what happened? If you want to be successful in any endeavor, you need to go through the preliminary steps that's necessary to get there. Otherwise, you, you end up dying in the well. It would have been better for him had he forgone walking and quietly remained in his own place. Now, I'm going to quote, uh, uh, something from Proverbs, right? Which is in Proverbs 21, that's a safer Mishle. And this is another fascinating example of how Rambam uh, interprets verses. And it's, it's, a beautiful, um, it's a beautiful interpretation. So here, let's, let, we'll see how Rambam learns a Pasuk, a verse in Mishle, in Proverbs. So if we go to, um, uh, hold on, let me pull it up, I'm sorry. Um, I had this somewhere. Oh, there it is. Okay, so it's in Proverbs 21, uh, verse uh, 25 through 26. Okay, so um, so in, in Mishle, it says the following verse. Ta'avat otzel timitenu, the craving, the desire of the lazy man will end in his death. Ki me anu yadav la'asos, because he held back his hand from doing their work. He didn't do the work. He was lazy, and that will, his desire is what will kill him. Kol hayom his avot ta'ava, all day he desires and desires and wants. In other words, but, but, but he never gets there, right? But tzadik yitain v'lo yachsoch. However, the, the, um, a righteous man, he gives to him v'lo yachsoch and doesn't hold back from him at all. Now, there's several things in this, um, in this verse here that Rambam is bothered by, which he's going to answer with the ideas that he's expressing now in a, in a really beautiful way. And that is, right, um, and, and let's see here. And now I'm, I'm in the English here in, on page 76. In Proverbs, Solomon describes at length the state of lazy people and their incapacity. All this being a parable for the incapacity to seek knowledge of the sciences. That the, 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 the lazy person is the one who he wants to get these lofty spiritual ideas but he doesn't want to start off with the basics, which Ramam tells us is the sciences, learning about, about the facts of the world, how the world is. Thus, speaking of the desire of someone desirous to achieve his ends, right? His avata, he wants, he desires, but that's what's going to kill him, right? Because making no effort to achieve knowledge of the preliminary studies leading up to these ends does nothing else but desire, all he wants, right? The desire of the slothful, of the lazy, is what kills him. For his hands refuse to labor, he refuses to do the work. I, I mean, this is such a beautiful interpretation of these verses. It's like it's hard to read the verse in any other way once you see the Ramam's interpretation. He coveteth greedily all 
day long. And here's a very interesting verse here. He desires greedily. He desires something all the time, but only the righteous. Now, Ramam is going to ask, what do you mean righteous? We're talking about a, when you think of the opposite of a lazy person, what do you think? You think of a hardworking person, right? Um, you don't think of a, when you think of a righteous person, the opposite is an evil person, right? We're not thinking of, um, uh, uh, Jeff, we're, we're, we're in uh, on chapter 34, one, and in the Pines, it's page 76. Uh, so it's Chelek Rishon Perek Lamedalid is where we are right now. Okay. Um, so, um, so the, the, um, uh, I'm sorry. So, so what, why is this, why is the, the lazy person being compared with the righteous person? Okay. Why the lazy person should be compared with the hardworking person. In these verses, and now I'm reading from the Pines English now, in these verses, he says that the reason why the desire of the slothful kills him is to be found in the fact that he makes no effort and does not work with the view to that which would allay that desire. He wants the achievement, he wants this knowledge, but he's not willing to work and get there. He has only an abundance of longing and nothing else. All he wants is he desires and desires. He wants to get there, right? But he's not willing to do the work to get there. While he aspires to things for whose achievement he lacks the necessary instrument. It would be healthier for him if he renounced this desire. Such a person who's not willing to do the work, he's better off not having learned anything in the first place, right? Consider now how the ending of the parable explains the beginning, because it says the righteous giveth and the spareth not. The word righteous is not antithetical to slothful. In other words, sadik is not the opposite of, of, of atzel, of lazy. However, except according to the explanation we have propounded, but the way I'm explaining it, Ramam says, it makes a lot of sense. A righteous, to achieve righteousness, to achieve knowledge of God, one needs to not be lazy. One, because it takes work to get there. And if you're not willing to do the work, you're lazy and you will not ever be a tzaddik. You will not ever be a righteous person. For Shlomo says that just one among men is he who gives everything it's due. He means thereby he, that he gives all his time to seeking knowledge and spares no portion of his time for anything else. He says, as it were, but the righteous gives his days to wisdom and is not sparing of them, which corresponds to his saying, give not thy strength unto women. Women in this context means uh, uh, going after uh, worldly desires, right? So instead of wasting your time chasing things uh, that, that are not, Get bringing you up to a higher spiritual level, he wastes his time, um, you know, doing other stuff. Now, the majority of the men of knowledge, and here the Ramam is saying this like tongue in cheek, the, all the people out there that everyone thinks are smart, all those guys out there that everyone thinks they're smart guys, the majority of them, I mean, those generally known as men of knowledge, that people think that they're smart, labor under this disease. I mean, that which consists in seeking to achieve the ends and in speaking about them without having engaged in the studies preliminary to them. How many times have we all listened to people talking about things as if they know what they're talking about when they really don't know what they're talking about? <clears throat> My father uh, is, was once mentioned to me after he went to a seminar being given by a certain person who posed as a scholar. Uh, and he said, uh, he said to me afterwards kind of, um, he said, you know, she, she read one book on the subject and now she's the expert, right? <laughs> you know, uh, like, you know, it, it, if an expert means a person that studied it, that learned it, that knows it, such a person you can learn from. But uh, so many people today get, go around and they're the experts, right? When all they do, they're just parroting these ideas without ever having gone through the process of learning them and proving them and knowing them. I mean, just think for a moment about how many times we see people spouting forth about all sorts of ideas, whether they're their friends or acquaintances or whether they're politicians, which happens all the time, or, or some other person spouting forth words of wisdom on, uh, on the economy or, I don't know, pick your political issue when they actually have no idea what they're talking about. You know, uh, all they know is how to say the words, but they ha they've never studied economics. They don't know the process behind it. They don't know the mechanisms behind it. With some of them, their ignorance or their desire to have the first place goes so far as to cause them to disapprove of these preliminary studies. They say, it's a waste of time. Don't bother studying philosophy. I know it all already. Don't bother studying economics. This is the bottom line. Don't bother studying political science. All you need to know is this, right? So they poo-poo the whole thing, which they are incapable of grasping or too lazy. Either they don't, they're doing that because they're too, they don't have the mental capacity to do so, or they're just simply too lazy to do so. Accordingly, 
They wish to show that these studies are harmful or useless. So instead, they turn it the other way and they say, ah, it's, it's a waste of time. Those guys sitting in the in, in learning and studying these things, they're wasting their time. It's all a waste of time. I already know the bottom line. Here it is. Um, however, when one reflects, the truth of the matter is clear and manifest. If you think about it, obviously the truth is that if you really want to know something, you got to study it and you got to be willing to put in the work. This, what Ramam is saying here is so relevant to us in, in everything and pretty much almost any interaction that involves an exchange of knowledge that we have, you know, um, and it's something that really speaks to us today. So this is the end of the third reason why we shouldn't just jump to, um, to uh, knowledge, uh, uh, to godly knowledge, philosophical knowledge that Ramam is trying to teach us in this book is that the, is the fact that it takes the process to get there. And so many people are just simply not willing or not able to get, go through that process. It takes time, it takes work, you need to understand it. Since we are at lecture number 26, hopefully we can say that we're taking the time together to get there. And we're not just jumping to the end knowledge, right? Whether Rambam would agree or not, I don't, I don't know. But then he says the, the, um, he says the uh, uh, next reason, um, and that is, the uh, uh, fourth cause. So what's the fourth cause? The fourth cause is to be found in the natural aptitudes. And this is pretty straightforward. Uh, and this is, I guess, somewhat controversial, but we're going to see how Rambam deals with it. And that is people's innate skills and abilities, what they're born with, right? For it has been explained or rather demonstrated that the moral virtues, but before he does that, Rambam is going to say something that is an extremely powerful idea. Uh, and, and it's an idea which which really underlies this entire Rambam. And that is, is that, um, and I'll say it outside before I say it inside. And that is that the Rambam believed with the deepest possible conviction that in order to achieve, people think about Rambam as this intellectual guy of someone who teaches all these lofty intellectual and philosophical ideas, but they don't think of him as a moral guy. Rambam is about to lay this out solid and he's gonna say this many times that a person that thinks he or she has intellect and knowledge without having morality and ethics first will never achieve knowledge. Ramam felt and believed and taught, and he's about to do it now, that if you don't have true humility, and we're gonna see this inside in a minute, if you're not humble enough to recognize when you're wrong, and if you're not, uh, and if you're not uh, uh, humble enough to, to know that you have to, your moral and ethical character has to be solid, then your knowledge will never lead to the truth. And we know that this is true. We know this from modern psychological um, uh, uh, studies. You know, a scientist who's arrogant will never get to the truth because he or she will get wedded to a certain idea that they think is right. And they'll defend it at all costs because they take it personally if they're wrong. A scientist that's able to achieve and make true discoveries is one who's humble enough to say, you know what, that's a good point. I think I'm wrong. I'm going to get back to the drawing board and see what else I can figure out. That's the only way to get to the truth. If someone without humility will never get there. And Ramam is going to say this really, he's about to say this. I just paraphrased it in my own terms. If you're not ready to accept that you're wrong, if you're not ready to be humble, if you're not ready to, to, to listen to other people, if you're, not ready, if you're not ready to be an ethical, moral person, then you will never get to the knowledge of the truth, period. And this is the Ramam lays it out solid. It has been explained or rather demonstrated. So Ramam is telling us people have said this, but it's been proven in, in Ramam's equivalent of scientifically that the moral virtues are a preparation for the rational virtues. You can't claim to be a rationalist if you aren't moral, period, stated, black on white, right? It is impossible to achieve true rational acts. I mean, perfect rationality. One cannot truly understand when it says the word rationality here, it's talking about, you know, purity of your mind, true thoughts, the knowledge of the truth, unless it be by a man thoroughly trained with respect to his morals and endowed with the qualities of tranquility and quiet. Ramam is soon going to bring some really beautiful proofs of this from various verses in the Torah, and we'll get to them in a minute. But then he says, so if you don't have true moral qualities to begin with, such as the following examples, there are many people who have received from their first natural disposition, a complexion of temperament with which perfection is in no way compatible. Somebody is just, the, the way they are as a person is just not compatible with achieving intellectual perfection, right? Such as the case 
of a person who's who just cannot refrain from anger. I'm going to go through this a little quickly. So if he subjects, so he, no matter how hard he tries, the guy's just, he's just an angry person. He'll never, ever get there. It's impossible if an angry person won't get there because he's, he's immoral. He's just not moral. This is also the case of one, uh, he, the way he describes it is uh, very medieval-like. But a person who's just so consumed by his, uh, you know, his desire for sexual fulfillment that he's constantly looking for more fulfillment. He says his testicles have a hot and humid temperature. You can read it, but the point being that he'll never, he'll be so interested in satiating his physical desires that he's never going to achieve everything that he does will be for the for the purpose of satiating his physical desires. He's never going to get to the point. If he doesn't have moral character, he's never going to get to spiritual fulfillment. Similarly, you can find among people rash and reckless folk whose movements are agitated and disordered. Um, I'm, I'm kind of uh, paraphrasing a little here again. Um, you know, they, they, they just simply, they're not, not rational. The things they do are just, they're not consistent. They're not consistent with their ideas. They're not consistent in their actions. Such a person can never get to where they're supposed to get. And to make an effort for their benefit in this matter is pure ignorance on the part of him who makes the effort. If you try, you're never going to get there. For this science, and this is kind of curious exactly what Rama means in this next sentence, and I'm in the middle of page 77 in the Pines, is not like the science of medicine or the science of geometry, right? In other words, I can teach you, any one of these guys that I described before, I can teach him or her uh, certain basic physical sciences. I can tell them, you give the guy this medicine for this disease, or this, this is a triangle, and this is how you calculate the, the, the ge geometry of the triangle, right? But, but that can be done by a person with that temperament. But to get to true philosophical truth, um, which Ramam is teaching us in this book, not everyone has the disposition required for it in the various respects we've mentioned. Not everyone can achieve that. If you don't have moral character, in other words, his bottom line is what he's saying is, you can be an immoral doctor, right? You can be an immoral lawyer and you can even be a good doctor, but you're still immoral. Good in the sense that you know medicine. You can be a good engineer and know geometry and build buildings, even if you are an immoral person, that's possible. But to be a person that knows God, to be a person that knows philosophy, you have to be a good person. You can't do it. You can't achieve that without moral and ethical uh, behavior to back it up beforehand, to build upon. It is accordingly indubitable that preparatory moral training should be carried out before beginning with the science. This is famous. We know the famous uh, dictum of the Mishnah Derech Eretz, Kodmol Torah. Being a, a mensch, being a decent person comes before studying Torah. So not only do you have to have knowledge of the world, be, be willing to learn about your surroundings that, that, that you see and, and, and so on before you get to Torah, right, to get to knowledge of God, you also have to be a good person, you have to be a moral person, you have to be an ethical person, so, um, uh, uh, so that man should be in a state of extreme uprightness and perfection, for the perverse is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret is which, so Hashem the secrets of God can only go to those who fear God, for this reason, the teaching of the science to the young is disapproved of, we can't do it to children that are too immature to get this, it is in fact, in fact, it is impossible for them to absorb it because their nation, they're, they're, they're so involved in their growth and, 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 and in other words, in, in worldly matters that they can't get there. Of course, there are exceptions to this rule. Ramam is saying this in a general way. There are some children that are on different levels. When this flame that, however, when the flame that gives rise to perplexity is extinguished, the young can achieve tranquility and quiet. In other words, they can grow there. They can get there right, and their hearts submit and yield with respect to their temperament, and then they can sit down patiently and listen and learn. They then may call upon their souls to raise themselves up to this rank, which is that of the apprehension of him. To apprehend and achieve and understand God, you can get there, but first you have to get beyond those youthful characteristics of, uh, that, that are characteristic of, uh, of youth in this case. I mean thereby the divine science that is designated as the account of the chariot. And we've said this from the beginning of this class, Ramam considers divine science, which is knowledge of God, to be the, what, what the, the Tanakh calls the Merkava, the account of the chariot, which uh, we'll get in, you know, we're going to continue to discuss. So here is um, just a few um, examples. Uh, I'm going to read one example from Isaiah. I'll read it. I'll read it out loud. Uh, um, uh, the Ramam translates into English, but this is Isaiah um, uh, 57, verse 15. It's a, it's a beautiful verse. It's probably familiar to many of you. Uh, but if it's not, it's, it's worth thinking about for a minute. And 
since Isaiah is this as my favorite prophet and writes so beautifully, I, I can't help. I have to read the original Hebrew, which is just stunningly, stunningly beautiful. For so says he who is exalted and upon high. This is my, I'm translating my own translation. He who rests all the way above the Kadoshimo, he whose name is holiness. Marom He um I this is what he says. I dwell in the places that are lofty and holy. However, it was it is with he who is who is humble, who is lowly of spirit. The, even though I reside all the way up here, who do I reside with for real? Who do I revive? It's lahachiot ruach shifalim. I revive the spirits of those that are humble, that are low. Lahachiot lev nitchayim. I revive the hearts of those who are contrite, of those who are who are willing to to learn and are willing to study. This is one of the uh, one of the most beautiful um, uh, 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 verses in Isaiah, who, which is a book packed with beautiful verses. And the Ramam quotes it in the end, uh, starting and it says, "I dwell in the high and holy place," and so on. You can read it. And then we're going to turn to the page to 78. Idea being, right, um, that, uh, and then he quotes from the Talmud, right? This chapter headings may be transmitted to him only, in other words, if you're going to teach Masim or Kava, only to one whose heart within him is full of care, one who cares, one who's concerned, one who's a good person. The purpose of this is to signify obedience, submission, and great piety joined to knowledge. In order to gain knowledge, you have to be pious. You have to be humble. You have to be ready to submit to the truth. You can't be arrogant and hold on to your ideas and, and make your ideas so personal to you that you refuse to let go of them, even when faced with the truth. Um, think about that because we're all guilty of this at times. We stick with certain ideas because we identify with them and we're not willing to let go, even when we're faced with facts that clearly, clearly, clearly demonstrate that we should live and know a different truth. We're just not willing to, to, to learn that. Now, these are matters that undoubtedly require a natural predisposition. Do, um, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of paraphrase a little more. I'm in, still on page 78, but I, I just want to, um, you, know, uh, you know, emphasize that this, this, this idea of the Rama underlies this entire book. It's the thing that the people that don't read the Morna Bukhim don't understand about the Morna Bukhim. The Morna Bukhim is, yes, about philosophy, and it is, yes, about all these lofty philosophical ideas, but it has to start with the foundation of basic ethics and basic morals. Otherwise, you can never get there. And the Rambam lays that out black on white here. Um, so uh, do you know among various people, one who is very feeble in point of opinion, though he be the most understanding of men? Another, on the other hand, may have an unerring opinion and an excellent way of conducting affairs and political matters. Such a one is called a counselor. He, he knows how to how to maneuver people, how to get, you know, uh, get things done. However, someone of that sort might not understand an intelligible notion, but if you try to explain to him something important, um, even though we're close to being one of the first intelligibles, even if it's one of the most basic philosophical ideas, he might be very stupid and lacking in ingenious devices. Thus it is said, wherefore is there a price in the hand of a fool to buy wisdom, seeing he hath no heart for it? You need to have the heart for wisdom. You need to get yourself there. Among men, you can have a person who's full of understanding and capable of con giving concise and coherent expressions to the most hidden notions. Such a person is called endowed with understanding of whispering. However, so someone of this sort does not necessarily occupy himself with and achieve knowledge of the sciences. So that person might be what Raman says, wise in crafts. In other words, there's ways for people to gain skills in different things and different matters, but that doesn't um, necessarily um, uh, you know, mean that they've achieved this lofty level that Ramam is trying to tell us. Consider how, by means of a text of a book, they lay down as conditions of the perfection of the individual. Think about how all of these sources that I just quoted from Isaiah, from Chazal, from the Talmud, from everywhere. In the book, they lay down this idea, right? That in order for a person to be perfect, his being perfect in the varieties of political regimes, as well as in speculative sciences and so on, right? Right, if all this is, is realized in someone, if a person has achieved that, then the mysteries of the Torah may be transmitted to him. That's when you could teach him. And that's the point of this whole, this whole speech here, that in order to get to the point where you can study and learn and be taught the Masih Merkava, the knowledge of God, you have to have gone through all of those processes, the learning of the sciences, 
the learning of the logic, being a humble person, being an ethical and moral person, then we can do this. Um, he, so, and, and he brings a story uh, uh, from Rabbi Yochan Rabbi Lazar. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of skip through that, okay? But um, so that's, that's the fourth reason. Uh, again, just really quick, just to remind you, the fourth is the fact that, um, that a person has to be, you have to be moral before you can understand it. And a lot of people are just not moral. That's the bottom line of what he just said in the fourth part. So the third reason was there's a long process to get there. And a lot of people aren't willing to go through that process either because they're too lazy or too unwilling. And the fourth is the fact that, um, that you have to be a good person and you have to be a humble person. And not everyone is ready to be humble. Not everyone is. The fifth cause is to be found in the fact that men are occupied with the necessities of bodies. It's a practical thing. We got to make a living. We got to work. We got to eat. We got to drink. We got to do things. We got whatever it is we got to do. Right. And more particularly, if in addition, you're occupied with taking care of your wife and of your children, especially if it, there is in them super added to that, a demand for superfluities, you know, things that you don't need. I need a bigger house. I need a pool in my backyard. I need a bigger car. I need to I have to work harder. I have to make more money. I need to I need to buy a, a fatter steak and a fancier bottle of wine or whatever. Right. And so the, you're constantly searching after more and more and more. You're wasting time. Right, you know, you you know, I just told you there's a whole process to get to knowledge of God. If you're going to waste your time doing all this other stuff, you're never going to have time to get there. Right, things are so that if even a perfect man, as we have mentioned, were to occupy himself with all the necessary things, um, and all the more so if you decide to occupy yourself with unnecessary things, and then your desire for unnecessary things gets stronger and stronger, he would find that his theoretical desires have grown. By the time you're finished, you know. Yeah, you know, you look back at all those years and what did I do? I have achieved, now, yay, I have a nice house, I have a nice car, but I achieved nothing spiritually. I got nowhere, right? And his demand for them would slacken and become intermittent. Eventually, you just become numb to it. You know, you're just not interested anymore. Yeah, I got what I have. I'll sit on my couch. I'll have a, a cup of scotch. I'll watch my TV show and that'll be the end of it, you know? Uh, but of course, all of us are here together learning God. So we're doing something different learning this godly ma matters. He accordingly would not grasp things that otherwise ha would have been within his power to grasp. He could have done it had he lived his life differently, but he chose not to. He chose to pursue other things, but he would have been able to, or else he would grasp them with a confused apprehension, or he might think he knows them, but he doesn't. You know, he might think he knows everything. I, I, we can all close our my eyes and think of someone who probably sat next to us in shul one day who thought he knew everything. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I, I'm sure, you know, I could close my eyes. I'm not going to say who, I'm not going to say where, but we can definitely think of that person who thought they knew everything, but did they actually know everything? No. And usually what's the difference between the two? The guy that actually knew something is the guy that actually put the time in to learn it, right? The guy that doesn't know anything is the guy that's just shooting his mouth off and claiming that he knows everything, but he doesn't, right? Um, in view of all these causes, these matters are only for a few solitary individuals of a special sort. Now, I view this last paragraph here in, in, the, in 34 as a little bit slightly tongue in cheek, because I, the way I see it from the Ramam, the truth is, is that it's not for only solitary individuals. It's actually for everyone. The problem is that only solitary individuals follow all these instructions that I've been giving you. So therefore, it ends up that it's only solitary individuals that do it. I hope that, that makes sense, right? So he doesn't mean it's only for a few solitary individuals of a very special sort, not for the multitude, because the multitude is incapable or unable to do it, which is how many people interpret the Rama. I personally don't believe that's what the Rama actually means. I personally believe, because based on how we've read until now, the Rama told us how to get past all that stuff and become one of these special solitary individuals. And those are tools that we actually all do have if we're willing to try. If we follow his instructions, don't waste our time with superfluous things. Spend the time it takes to learn. Spend the time it takes to learn about the world around us and build the foundations. We can get there. For this reason, they should be hidden from the beginner. That's why we keep it away from the beginner. We, and, and the way I read this is he doesn't necessarily mean a beginner in the sense that he's young or just starting to learn, but he's, we keep it away from the person who isn't ready to put in the work necessary to get to the ultimate end, which is the truth. And he should be prevented from taking them up. We'd rather have him not be involved because we see what kind of danger it is. The guy who's not involved is the guy who's going to get up there and say, yeah, it's all a bunch of baloney, right? 
because of course he thinks it's a bunch of baloney because he never went through the process to learn how we've proven all these facts. Just as a small baby is prevented from taking coarse foods and from lifting heavy weights. You know, you don't take a person who's not ready for it and give them things that are way above their level. I'm gonna stop here. Uh, we, there's a lot to chew on from today, but I, I hope uh, it can lead to some uh, some conversation here. If anyone wants to, um, to uh, bring up any questions, comments, observations, disagreements, yeah, whatever I, I, it is. I have an observation. Okay. Given the wording here uh, and, and uh, our, our reaction to how high these, these, um, these uh, what should I say, hurdles are to, to uh -huh. becoming the, the model that he says you need to in order to mm -hmm. get to that level. Right. Um, is it possible that you're reading, you're trying to read away more than you, you should because it's so contrary to the democratic spirit and the sense of the Torah, of, of, of including the, you know 600,000 people, that they're all at Mount Sinai. There's an underlying democratic theme uh, that, that appears on the surface to, to be a, a, part of, a part of Judaism as we understand it, at least as I understand it. And, and when you come across Maimonides, who seems so elitist, uh, it, it's, it's so contrary to what you want to believe, he says, I mean, is it possible that you're going a little too far in what we've just heard? It's definitely possible. Uh, it's definitely possible. And um, and I might be misreading Rambam because of my democratic tendencies, as if you will, or my liberal tendencies. Um, I do think, though, that it's the general sense that you get. Like, there's no question a lot. Most scholars look at the Rambam as an elitist, and he certainly is an elitist, you know, Within what we just read today, he 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 pushes off all kinds of people that are unworthy. But I the thing is though, there's so many little places, and we've come across them where you have these little flashes of light where you can tell that he's talking to everyone, you know. And and I think, you know, and you'll see. I mean, you may conclude that I'm wrong, you know, but or you may conclude that you agree, you may have a different conclusion, but um. Yeah, I, I, but it's definitely possible that I'm seeing in it what I want to see, you know? I mean, uh, we'll see. I, I, I don't know. You, you have to decide for yourself if you think I'm guilty of that. Okay, well, good. We're, yeah. just, we're only at 26. We'll talk about this when we're at 100. <laughs> right, right, right. Any other uh, observations or comments? Yes, I, I have a question. Um, with, you say the rabbi, um, that uh, Maimonides... Um, um, says that morality or morals pre pre precede um, um, uh, Go ahead. precede uh, yeah. other things in right. yeah no, knowledge of God or uh, yeah does he or knowledge of truth does he specifically uh, state that the morality comes from the the Chumash or the the the, the Jewish books, or because any uh, anybody can claim to be moral, depending on where where they get their the morals from. Their, yeah. So that's a really that's a, I'm really happy you brought that up because because Ramam is very clear to tell us what he means by morality, and it's defined as humble. Ramam goes directly to the words of the prophets, right? And he says, he brings from Psalms, he brings from Isaiah, he brings from Proverbs, that being a moral and ethical person, the type that's necessary to gain true knowledge, Raman doesn't say a word about wearing tzitzis or keeping kosher, right? He says, you need to be humble, right? And 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 as dako shvaruach, lacho shvaruach, you know, shvalim, you know, right? It's, it's, it's God resides among he who is humble, right? Right. And, and, and that's what's required, that morality is based on humility. And this is a theme I'm going to come back to probably hundreds, if not thousands of times as we go through these classes. And I, I do this when I teach Tanakh as well, is that the underlying theme of most of the prophets is that the bottom line is humility. I mean, the most famous is the quote from Micha, right? Which is from Micah, which is, you know, what, what do I want? That's that's what God wants, right? He wants us to walk humbly, walk humbly with God, right? Humility is the bottom line, right? 
After that, you can you can achieve anything. And without that, you achieve nothing. And 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 Ramam said that, and we're gonna see it over again and over again and over again. And and um uh, and we'll um we'll see it come up more often. So I'm really happy that you brought that up because 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 morality does not mean that you keep the, the not that the Ramam doesn't believe you're supposed to keep the Torah. Of course he does. He's gonna the entire Khalek Gimel, the entire third uh book is why we should keep all the laws of the Torah. And we'll get there one day, right? But 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 morality is defined as humility. And 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 I say that it's a strong statement, but I, I'll back it up. <laughs> and besides the fact that Ramam just said it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Any other comments? You said third book. I, I only see two volumes of this. There's the uh, there's two volumes of the book, but you'll see there's a part one, part two, and part three. If you look in the second volume, there's a two and a part two and a part three. That's how it's divided. Okay. Um, well, okay. I'm looking. It says part one, one, volume two, part two. I don't see a part three. But, oh, I see it. I see it. There's yeah. A part three. Yeah, yeah. Part three is primarily uh, Tameh HaMitzvot. It's primarily the reasoning behind all the mitzvot, which is fascinating and it and we'll get there i mean this is going to take us a while but we'll get there you know why you know the, the rambam emphatically believed that the entire torah is rational and logical right he couldn't accept that there's that there's irrational reasons behind the rules that the torah gives us so the torah tells us to where it's you see there has to be a reason there has to be logic behind it and but that's a it's a huge topic it's a major topic but you know and ramam disagreed with a lot of other jewish philosophers about that very idea you know and well we'll get there you know definitely. isn't that contrary by the way to humility like the red heifer right for him to give the anticipation is part three we're going to find out about <laughs> right doesn't that require a rather chutzpah dip, uh, 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 attitude and he, if he's going to take on all of that so it depends how you take it on. If you take it on with the humility of knowing that you might be wrong, then it doesn't, you know, and, and, and the Ramam will very much do that. He will always suggest that, that this is what I'm suggesting is the reason, but I might be wrong. You know, someone else might come down the road, you know, hundred years from now, a thousand years from now and say, there's a different reason. Um, and, and, and we'll, we'll, we will get there. I mean, it's very, um, it's very important. Um, any other comments anyone else have anything interesting to say I, th I thought today was a particularly fascinating piece here if there isn't um we can move on to next week uh and uh thank you everyone for joining and uh and we're looking forward to next week thanks for for joining us have a good one have a good evening bye-bye thank you rabbi thanks, thanks.